He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Well, before we begin this morning, uh, I just wanted to recognize some important people in the room, because tomorrow is Veterans Day. Uh, this year is my first year as an American citizen, uh, and I, I thank you. And only in America do you get applauded for being an American. It's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. British people could take a lesson from that. But tomorrow is an important day. Because we recognize and we remember those amongst us who have fought for our freedom. If you were a veteran, could you stand for me just for a moment? Do you have any veterans today? Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. You know, becoming an American this year has changed this day a little bit for me because I now recognize that what I experience, what I have been able to do, is in part thanks to men and women like you that have served for us, that have defended our and protected our freedom. So again, we thank you. Let me pray uh, just a word of blessing over you. Father, thank you for these men and women who have given so much of their lives to defend us, to protect us in ways that we probably won't ever be able to fully grasp. And God, we ask just a special blessing on them today for their service, that you would be near to them Uh, Because you are the true veteran who fought for us, for our freedom, and have lived, and are living now. So Lord, we thank you for uh, your gift, and for the gift that you have brought us through these men and women. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are continuing our study of the book of Colossians today, uh, and I wanted to start with uh, a story about my Halloween, because I got to do something very special this Halloween. My son was really excited about a black Spider-Man costume that he would saw online, so I decided to be a good dad. I was going to get it for him, and uh, while I was shopping for this black Spider-Man costume, I noticed there was another costume, an adult Spider-Man costume right beside it, and I did what any reasonable adult should do. I bought it immediately. And uh, I had it delivered, it was spectacular, it was great. The inner 11-year-old in me was so excited. Uh, But then I had another idea. I was like, I could put this on and deliver Jonathan's Spider-Man costume to him as Spider-Man. So I have a picture here. I dressed up as Spider-Man to deliver uh, Jonathan's little Spider-Man costume to him. And they completely bought it. They thought I was Spider-Man. I was pretty jacked up about just wearing that Spider-Man suit. I didn't really want to take it off, but Janae told me I had to. Um, But yeah, yeah. Because I really loved the way that my son looked at me when I wore this costume. When I put this on, for all uh, he knows and for all he could understand, I was Spider-Man. I'd assumed that identity. That's who I had become. And it felt really good to be looked at by my son as a superhero. And as kind of funny and silly as that is, I think we live in a culture where many of us assume identities because they feel good, because they give us meaning, significance, or purpose. That's what we're really talking about when we talk about the idea of identity. We're talking about what defines us as people, what gives our lives purpose and meaning. And there's many things that we can find ourselves in, many costumes that we can wear. Maybe for you, it's not a Spider-Man outfit. Maybe for you, it's what you do, your profession, a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, businesswoman. Maybe for you, it is being a family man or a family woman. You could be a mother or a father, a husband or a wife. There's many things that you can find yourself in, and it's on this rack, this rack of identities that the world offers to us. And the list is endless. We could go through them all more and more and more, what you could define yourself by, what you could find your meaning and your purpose in. But the gospel offers us a better story than the one that the world does about identity. See, the gospel doesn't have an endless rack of identities that we need to assume and become and define ourselves by, there's one, Christ. And I think that the message of Colossians, as we continue to read this letter about 
this great Christ who has done amazing things, who is over all things and in all things, we read the story about an identity, an identity that's given to us through that same Christ that he has won for us. And it's better than any identity that we can assume for ourselves. So I want to read Colossians 3, 1 through 17 with you today. And I want to look at this idea of identity. Look at three things that Paul alludes to. He alludes to the search for identity, the old identity, and the new identity. So let's read this together in Colossians 3. And we're going to do this just a chunk at a time because we've got a big passage today. So this is verses 1 through 4. He says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So we're talking about the search for identity. The search for identity. Now, when I was a kid, my dad really liked magic eye illusions. I don't know whether you guys remember these, but they were really big in the 90s. Uh, you could get these whole books of images that were kind of jumbled, different colors, different lines, and hidden somewhere in that image was a true image. And I would try and do it many, many times. I couldn't do it. But the key was you had to change your perspective. You had to shift what you were looking at, and then this hidden image would appear for you. And I think that optical illusions and things like that still remain pretty popular. There's a, a popular one that I saw on Facebook not too long ago. I wanted to show it to you. So you've got a picture here that it looks like this rock is floating, and it's got trees growing on top, and it's kind of confusing. What, how did they get this shot? Is it edited? Is it done on a computer, but if we change our perspective and we change that image upside down, we'll see that it's just a rock in a lake, that the trees are the reflection and that the illusion of it floating was because it was out of perspective. Now, when we think about the search for identity and where we look to define ourselves and give ourselves purpose, it's really a matter of perspective. It's a matter of which identity rack are we looking at? Are we looking at this one or this one? Because there's two very different racks in this world. There is the identities that the world gives us, and then there's the identity that Christ gives us. And in these first few verses of Colossians 3, Paul is starting now to unpack what is different about our identity because of Jesus. He's told us in Colossians 2 already that we have died with Christ, that what was us has been put to death. It's gone into the grave with him, that Jesus has made us completely New. And now he's saying, starting, if then you have been raised. If what Jesus has done is real. If he really has defeated sin and death and brokenness. And he is undoing the curse of everything that is wrong in this world. Then we need to change our perspective. We need to change how we are thinking about our identity. We need to not look to this rack of different identities that the world provides us with, what we do, the things that we have done, the things that we could do. We need to look to what one has done, what Jesus has done. And so we get a different rack, a different rack of costumes and identities that doesn't have an exhaustive list of all these things that we could be or define ourselves by. It has one Jesus. And so Paul says, seek the things that are above, where Christ is. Set your minds on things that are above. See, Paul knows that there is a temptation in this life to dwell on Jesus for a few moments and get really excited about him, but then to let your attention shift somewhere else. Because there's a lot of things going on in life, a lot of important things that get our attention. But for Paul, Jesus is a revolutionary. He is the creator God in human flesh. He's the one who puts stars into space and galaxies into motion. And if he is the one who has raised us, if this is who this man is, then there should be an earthquake of sorts in our life. This great and powerful God coming into our lives, we die with him and are raised with him. That changes everything about who we are. So now we can't just give Jesus a casual glance. We need to seek and set our hearts and minds on him. 
Paul is telling us to consider where we are looking for our identity. Where is it that you put your heart? What are the things that you find yourself in? What are the things that you get lost in? Paul wants us to give up the scramble and the exhausting lifestyle of constantly trying to find an identity for ourselves in the many things that we could do, should do, will do, and to instead set our minds on Christ, who has by his blood, by everything that he has done in his life, purchased for us and given to us a new identity, a new life. So how do we seek and set, how do we fix ourselves on him? Well, it starts by prayer, as most things do. We need to spend time in conversation with Jesus. We need to put our attention on Jesus. If you're anything like me, the busyness of the week and the day kind of gets you distracted, and prayer becomes something you make time for if there's some time left. But what Paul is calling us to is to literally point our lives continually towards Jesus to seek him to put our attention on him. So we should be praying in every opportunity we have, not simply just praying for the things that we like in life, but praying things like, God, grow me in the knowledge of your son. God, help me to see the opportunities I have to love others, to be thankful towards you. Paul says in another one of his letters in Galatians, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. For those of, in this, those of us in this room today, there is an edge in our culture to live by this rack. But if we have been raised with Christ, then something's different. We have Christ who is all, in all, over all. We've received a new identity. So if we're gonna learn to walk in that identity, the first thing we need to do is we need to learn about the old identity and we need to put it off. So that's why Paul tells us about the old identity. Some of you guys know that uh, before Janae and I moved to Illinois, we lived in Waco in Texas, home of Chip and Joanna Gaines. And uh, when I was there, when I got out of college, I was uh, looking for my first job. Uh, I had a biblical studies degree, and unfortunately there was no ministry positions available, so I kind of did a few different things. And one of the things I did is I worked on a friend's farm for a little bit. Now, working on a farm in Texas in the summer may be the most miserable thing I've ever done in my life. Because you guys know Texas is hot. It's unreasonably hot. I've talked to Jesus a lot about it. I think he should do something about that. Because it's miserably hot. It's so hot that you can, it, it feels like literally the sun is in your face trash talking you. It's so horrible. And on one occasion on this farm, what my job was to do is I had to go up and down the farm rows and I had to weed out all these weeds. It would take hours and hours. And I was sweating and sweating and sweating. It was miserable. And by the end of the day, the shirt that I was wearing, which is a shirt that I quite liked, had become absolutely soaked with sweat. It had changed colors. It's pretty gross. And I went home that day. I took it off. I put it down. I showered, got clean, and went to bed. Well, the next morning... I was trying to hang this shirt back up. At this point, it was stiffer than cardboard. It was horrible. And Janine notices what I'm trying to do. And she says, I hope you're doing what I think you're doing and hanging that nasty, rotten piece of material in our closet. And I said, but I really like this shirt. It's one of my favorite shirts. I don't want to get rid of this shirt. But the truth is I needed to put that shirt to death. It was useless to me now. It was broken. It's not, it's not going to fit me. It was not going to be the shirt that I needed. Right, it's gross, it's broken. Paul is talking about things here when he talks about the old identity that we cling to, that we have this kind of edge in us to hold on to. And he's saying we don't need to anymore. We don't need to. Christ has taken those things into the grave. We didn't, don't need to hold on to them. This is why he says, starting in verse five, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. After he tells us to put our eyes on things above, Paul follows by saying, put to death, therefore. Put to death. 
It's a pretty graphic way of putting it. Paul is trying to edge us to say, don't just kind of leave these to the side. Make sure that there's no longer any room in your life for any of these things. Put them to death. And that starts with actively letting go of the things that no longer inform our identity. Getting rid of the things in our life that we shouldn't be building ourselves around because we have hope in Christ, because he's reconciled us, because we are right with the Father because of him. We don't need the other costumes anymore. Because the truth is many of the costumes on the rack of the world, many of the things that we find ourselves in, we find ourselves in those things because we're trying to justify ourselves. Well, maybe if I have the right profession, if I have an important profession, maybe God will love me more if I'm successful in that. Maybe if I lead my family well, then God will accept me. Even if you're not a believer in Christ, if you're an atheist completely, we still find these costumes and we wear them and we put these identities on to justify our lives, to make them meaningful and purposeful. And what Paul is saying is that we need to put this rack to death because it's not who we are anymore if we are in Christ. There's a lot of bad stuff in the things that he lists. It says sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires. A lot of things that most of us would hope are not in our lives, but if we're honest, sometimes find some place in our lives. One that's particularly interesting, I think, for us to think about is the passage where he says evil desires. And Here's why it's interesting, is the Greek word for evil desires that gets used frequently in the New Testament is a Greek word, epithemia. And what epithemia really means is desire that has gotten out of control. So when he says evil desires, what he's saying is des desires that have mastered you, desires that are compulsive, desires out of control. That's the one that I feel like I resonate with a lot. Because there's a lot of good things in this world that God has provided us with that he's actually put a good desire in us for. But when that desire gets out of control, it's like a campfire that's got out of control. When a campfire is in the right boundaries, it's good. It can be so good. It warms us. We can cook on it. It's fun to get around with friends. But if that campfire bends out of control, it becomes incredibly destructive. It becomes dangerous, harmful, hurtful. That's what desire out of control in our lives does. We take something good that God gives us and we long for it more than we should, we desire it more than we should, and so it fosters these destructive qualities in our hearts. Why do we covet, right? Why do we get jealous? It's because someone has something that we want more than we should. Why do we lie? It's because we wanna protect something that we think is important to us. We don't want others to see it or find out about it. We wanna hide it. Why do we slander other people? Because we don't like the way other people perceive them and we want to be perceived better. We have a desire to have a better reputation, to be seen as greater or better than someone else. Do you see how all of these things that Paul lists as much as we keep them at arm's length and say, I would never do those things, these things grow in us when we let something good become ultimate, something good become greater than it should be and we desire it more than we should. That's evil desire and that's really the heart of what sin is, is letting things get out of control. And Paul says that that's the old self. That's the self that is focused on self-preservation and self-protection and assuming an identity that will work for us. But we don't need to anymore. And he's the real joy of this, and I want this to be really clear. This is not God saying to us through Paul, here's some really bad things, stop doing them. This is God saying to us through Paul, those things aren't who you are anymore. That's why you shouldn't do them. Yes, they're really bad, but the better reason why we should put these things to death is it's not who we are anymore. It's not who Christ has made us by his sacrifice and by his resurrection. That's not who we are. We are defined by Christ now. We are wrapped up in Christ, hidden in Christ. Did you know that when the Father in heaven looks at you, he sees Jesus? As much as all of us in this room have all fallen so far short of God's glory, because of Jesus, because of his infinite love for us, when God sees us, he sees us as if we were Jesus. That's the identity that we have been given. 
So we need to put off and put to death all those things that don't match that identity because they're of no use to us. They're gross, broken things that God wants to set us free from. But what we tend to do is we tend to kind of put it off halfway. We've got this identity that we hold on to. And because of Christ, he goes into the grave, he puts it to death, and and we're told in this passage, not only that we should put off, but that he has put off. And so we start peeling it off, this identity that we have. But we kind of let it hang by the elbows because there's parts of it that that we're still drawn to. We like finding ourselves in some of these things, so we hold on. And what Paul is saying is, this is what he's done. That doesn't fit you anymore, it's not right for you. We need to take it off all the way. We need to take this old identity off and we need to put it to death because it's useless to us. It's not who we are anymore. That's the joy of a new identity. A new identity. I want to talk about the new identity with you. Starting in verse 10, after he says, put off the old self, he says, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul finishes this section of Colossians in verse 17 by pointing us to the new self, this new identity that Christ has purchased for us, this real, true, and better identity. And he starts by telling the Colossians that this new self is being renewed in the image of its creator, Jesus. That's whose image it is in. And so that immediately undoes any need for these costumes. Immediately. That's why he says with some of the identities of the Colossians day, Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. These were some of the identities that the people of Colossae would cling to. Circumcised and uncircumcised was the Jewish believers that clung to this teaching in the Old Testament that they needed to be circumcised to truly be a part of the people of God. And Paul says, you don't need to cling to that identity anymore. That's not what defines you anymore. People would define themselves by their nationality, Greek, Scythian, these different people groups. And although that's an important and a significant part of who we are, it's not what we should build our whole life around. See, in God's eyes, the beauty of God's eyes is that we are all equal in Christ. There is no slave or free. There is no barbarian or Scythian. There is no Greek or Jew. There is just the people of God. Paul tells us in verse 12, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. This is who you are. God's chosen people, holy and beloved, washed clean by the blood of Jesus. As God's chosen ones, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, and patience. And here is Paul's logic. When we get to verse 13, he says, as the Lord has, so you also. He goes through these things. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you should forgive others. The reason we should put on compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and patience is because we want to be like the one whose image we are made in. Jesus is kind, so kind. Jesus is full of compassion. Jesus is patient, long-suffering. As he is, we can become because of what he's done. We can put on the new self that's made in his image. And notice that all of what we are called to, all of this new self, 
There's something very unique about everything that he says in there, and it's this. Every single one of them can't be done in isolation. They have to be done in community, right? He says, have compassionate hearts. How could we have compassionate hearts if we're not a part of community? If we're not involved in the affairs of our cities and in the lives of the people around us, in our neighbors, on our streets? We can't have compassionate hearts without someone to be compassionate to. We can't be kind without someone to be kind to. We can't be humble if we're not getting involved in other people's lives and laying our own life down. He goes on to say, as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. So Paul is assuming that there's people that we need to forgive and show grace to. That's a part of putting on the new self, is being dedicated towards being the first to forgive and give grace to people around you. Putting on the new self, really at its heart, means considering how you can love your neighbor. Right? Jesus said the greatest commandments are this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That right there is this new identity. To love our neighbors as ourselves. The old self was about self-preservation and self-elevation. The new self is about blessing our neighbors, other-centered living. This is why we talk about neighboring so frequently at Chapel Street, because what we believe is that if you are a follower of Jesus, you have been sent to this world for the sake of others. That God has saved you to be a blessing to your city, to your neighbors. That is the heartbeat of what it means to follow Jesus. So we can't follow Jesus if we are not gonna be others-centered, if we are not going to think about how we can bless our neighbors. So how do we do it? How do we put on this new self? He tells us two things. At the end of the passage, starting in verse 15, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. What's the peace of Christ? When he says the peace of Christ, what does he mean? What he means is right standing with God because of Jesus. We have peace with God through Jesus. God is not out to get you. He is not against you. You have peace with him because of Jesus. Let that sink deep into your soul and know that you're right with God. Let that be what defines you and gives you purpose and meaning and value. He says the word of Christ. What's the word of Christ? It's his teaching. It's the things that he's left us with. It's love your neighbor as yourself. Seek first the kingdom of God. Forgive those who persecute you. Let the words of Christ dwell in us richly, singing psalms and spiritual songs. You know one of the reasons we sing songs in worship is so that we can let the words of Christ dwell in us richly. Not just because we like the music, but because we want God's word to sink deep into who we are, to convict us, to challenge us, to make us think about the ways in which we are clinging to the old self and the ways we need to put on the new self. And he finishes by saying this in verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thankfulness is what marks all of these. Let the peace of Christ dwell in your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with thankfulness. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, every moment, every detail of our life is an opportunity to show thanks to the God who has loved us infinitely. Every conversation you have, every difficult person in your family, every challenge you face is an opportunity to reflect to this world the image of the one whose identity you now have. You have been renewed in the image of your creator God. So live as his as one that belongs to him, as one that's been changed by him, and embrace the gift of your new identity. Don't cling to this rack and all those costumes, but come to the new identity that has been bought by Jesus' blood that he's given as a free gift of grace and put it on. Knowing that this is who you are. 
It's not something you need to strive towards. It's not something you need to earn. It's been given to you to put on by grace. I want to finish with just one story really quickly. It's a story that I came across that I think really captures the power of a transformed identity. A story about a little girl who was uh, put into the adoption system. And she was adopted by a family, but this family didn't quite connect with her. And every year, this family would take a trip to Disney World. And they always left her behind. Now, they had some biological children that they would take with them, but they always left their adopted daughter behind. Imagine how painful that would be. It's always pointed out that you are not a part of the family. Unfortunately, that adoption ended up getting dissolved. Things fell apart. There was difficult behavior. It was a challenge to be sure. And so she was put back into the adoption system. And eventually she was adopted by another family, a Christian family. And this family took her in and tried to love her as best they could. And she was very difficult. There was a lot of challenges. And they had decided that they would take a family vacation to Disney World that year. And so they started getting ready. And the father noticed that as the closer they came to leaving for this trip, the more difficult the girl became. She would be cruel needlessly. She would lie about things that she had no need to lie about. These destructive patterns of behavior would come out. And the father realized that what was happening is that this girl had come from a situation in which every year she would be left behind. She wouldn't get to come on the trip. And so these destructive patterns would come out because she assumed again, I'm not part of the family. They're gonna leave me behind. They're not gonna take me with. So the father decides to sit down with her, brings her into his room, sits her on his knee. He says, I need to talk to you. And she says, I know what this is about. You're not gonna take me to Disney World, are you? And the father looked at her, knowing that this was an opportunity to show what it means to belong to Jesus. And he says, are you a part of our family? And she nodded said, then you're coming with us. It doesn't matter that you have been bad. It doesn't matter that you haven't obeyed. There'll be consequences for sure for that bad behavior, but we would never leave you behind because this is a family vacation and you're a part of the family. So they headed out to Disney World. The behavior was still difficult. The girl still acted out in many ways, but they reached Disney World. They had their first day of overpriced food and lines that were way too long. And they went back to their hotel room that night and the girl melted into a different person. She was quiet, tender, gentle. And as the father was tucking her in that night, he said, how was your first day at Disney World, sweetheart? And she turned over to him and she said something I think we all need to hear. She said this, I understand now. You didn't take me to Disney World because I was good. You took me to Disney World because I was yours. That's the gospel. This new identity, the things that Christ gives us, is because we belong to him by the blood of Jesus. You need not fear the ways in which you don't think you have lived up to the standard of holiness because that's not who you are. You belong to Jesus. And when the Father looks at you, he sees one that belongs to him. That's why we can embrace this new identity. Because we have been adopted into his family. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this morning, an opportunity just to sit in Colossians 3 and be reminded that we belong to you. That you have loved us. That you have washed us that you've stripped away from us the old self that was too often what we find find ourselves finding meaning and purpose in. And you have given us the new self, defined us not by what we do, but by what your son has done for us. Father, I pray you would fill our hearts with thankfulness for that this morning, that we would rejoice knowing that we belong to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.